Thank you very much for attending the session of, about uh, DNS-based uh, user tracking. My name is Amit Klein, and this is a joint research with uh, Professor Benny Pincus from the Barlan University. So, what do we need user tracking uh, to begin with? Uh, of course, there are all the uh, usual suspects, the uh, real-time targeted, targeted marketing and campaign measurement that we all uh, love and cherish, and then uh, fraud detection, protection against account hijacking, and various other reasons. Uh, back 20 years ago, tracking was uh, pretty straightforward. We all used cookies. Uh, we could also use uh, local storage and similar mechanisms. And we only had two browsers to, uh, to look after, uh, Internet Explorer and Mozilla, and one a very prominent uh, operating system being Windows. Uh, uh, fast forward for, uh, to today, we have uh, lots of uh, challenges in user tracking, uh, privacy mode boundaries, uh, which makes it difficult for some uh, tracking techniques. Uh, the challenge of uh, some uh, organizations using the same hardware and software uh, packages, um, having, to, uh, having to support multiple browsers on multiple operating systems. The whole mobile operating system was practically non-existent to, to, uh, 20 years ago. And of course, user awareness makes, makes uh, things uh, somewhat difficult with a browser restart, uh, history cleanups, and use, some users using uh, different browsers for different tasks. Uh, when uh, evaluating uh, tracking technologies, uh, we typically categorize them into two uh, broad uh, families. One is fingerprinting and the other is tagging. Fingerprinting technologies uh, try to uh, extract some uh, properties of the device, like uh, screen size, uh, uh, CPU, uh, GPU properties, and so forth, font, system fonts, and so forth, uh, whereas tagging technologies attempt to uh, write uh, a, a unique string of bits into, a, into the browser storage. And, and on subsequent uh, 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 invocation, they attempt to read back uh, this identifier, then, and this identifier is used as the, uh, as the tracking ID. And the two families uh, differ uh, very uh, strongly uh, with respect to six properties or, or six challenges. Let's for example, look at privacy mode boundary. Well, fingerprinting doesn't care about privacy mode because it measures uh, some properties of the device itself, of the operating system and the hardware. Whereas tagging typically fails with privacy mode because the privacy mode implementation uh, explicitly attempts to separate the storage of the privacy mode uh, in browser instance from the uh, uh, storage of the main browser instance. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, with uh, the, the golden image uh, challenge, fingerprinting typically fails because it measures the same, the same properties, the identical properties for all, this, uh, for all devices deployed by the organizations, by the organization, whereas the tagging uh, family of techniques uh, uh, succeed with uh, the golden image challenge because they write a, a unique identifier to each device. Uh, the coverage needs to be evaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. History cleanup uh, is, uh, is, is not, it does not defend against fingerprinting for obvious reasons, but it does typically uh, uh, protect against tagging. Browser restart is not a, a remedy for any of those uh, families. And, being, and fingerprinting is typically cross-browser, while tagging is not. And we designed a technique that is able to address each and every one of those six properties. Of, co of course, it's DNS-based, no surprise here. And while, it's, uh, with, while it does address all those six uh, uh, requirements, uh, we do have some disclaimers. It has a good coverage, but it's not perfect. It works across uh, browsers, but some combinations are exceptions. Uh, it doesn't work ag across network switches, so if you uh, if you are hooked to one Wi-Fi and then you move to a different Wi-Fi or a cellular network or, an, or your university network, network, the ID gets wiped out. And it has TTL limitation, time to live limitations that are imposed by uh, resolvers and stub resolvers that we will discuss later, which, which practically means that the longevity of the identifier is limited to typically somewhere between seven days and six hours. So before I describe the technique, Let's do a very quick DNS refresher. On the left-hand side, you see the device, 
uh, that we want to, uh, that, that uh, uh, in which we have a browser and a stub resolver, and the browser wants to navigate to HTTP www.example.com, but before it, but in order to establish TCP connection uh, with the uh, uh, with this uh, host, it needs to know the IP address because TCP connection works with IPs, not with host names. So it forwards uh, the uh, name to be resolved by the stub resolver using a, a standard API like uh, get ADDR info. The stub resolver forwards this now as a DNS query to the resolution platform. The resolution platform is configured uh, uh, as part of the network configuration and the stub resolver takes it uh, from there. Uh, and the resolution platform may include one or more DNS resolvers. The resolution platform does all the heavyweight uh, lifting uh, by traversing the DNS hierarchy from the root uh, DNS uh, server to the authoritative DNS server of uh, www of for the example.com domain. So it starts with the root name server. The root name server responds with, the, uh, best, with its best match, being the .com name server. The .com name server does a referral to example.com name server. And the example.com name server finally provides the IP address, the, the answer. The answer is forwarded by the resolution platform back to the stub resolver and also cached locally. Uh, the stub resolver forwards it to the browser and also caches it locally. And the browser finally has an IP address to, to establish TCP connection. And it can establish a TCP connection and start working with the web server. Great. So the crux of our technique is the ability to make each user uh, receive a different set of DNS resolutions. Why is that important, or how does that help us to achieve our goal of, uh, DNS, uh, of, of DNS tracking? Well, let's say that user one gets these, resolu these resolutions for x1.anonymity.fail, x2.anonymity.fail, and x3.anonymity.fail, etc. And each resolution is a set of IP addresses. In, in the case of X1, the IP, the, this, this list starts with 10456. In the case of X2, this list starts with 10123. And in the case of X3, it starts with 10789. We encode each first IP in the list uh, by a number. So 10123 is 1. 10456 is 2 and 10789 is 3 and thus the ID for user 1 is going to be 1013 and so forth whereas for user 2 we uh, assuming it gets uh, he or she gets a different uh, resolution uh, answers the ID will be 112 and so forth and we'll see in a moment how all this uh, is uh, uh, is implemented and how the ID is uh, calculated um, so for tracking, we need those components. We need a, an HTML snippet. It's an island that can be embedded inside your HTML, a larger HTML page. The island, this island con, uh, cons, consists of HTML and JavaScript code and can, and can calculate this ID for us. And it can share this ID with the embedding page or just send it to a server, uh, no matter. And this, the, uh, the way the island works is by embedding a, a script with SRC pointing to uh, the uh, X1 and to XN uh, hosts that the attacker owns. Uh, in the, the, all the hosts are in a, a unique uh, or in a dedicated uh, domain, the tracking domain, which is managed by a dedicated authoritative name server. And the tracking also runs a web server farm to cater for all those uh, X1 to XN.anonymity.fail uh, uh, JavaScript uh, requests. So the way it works is as following. The tracking, let's, let's look at the single resolution, the resolution of xi.anonymity.fail. Uh, we force this resolution by having the snippet uh, uh, refer, re reference a script with this uh, xi.anonymity.fail as its uh, source host. Uh, the browser then needs to resolve xi.anonymity.fail, uh, and it does so through the regular DNS uh, process until uh, the resolu resolution platform asks uh, the uh, authoritative name server for anonymity.fail for the address of xi.anonymity.fail, in, in, in which case, anonymity.fail responds with uh, a list of, in, in an, uh, a randomly ordered list of the IP, of the three IP addresses that the attacker owns. This list is then sent back to the stub resolver and also cached locally. And the stub resolver responds with this list to the browser, also caches it locally. And the browser sees that, takes the first IP address in the list, in this case it's 10456, sends it to the tracking web server. 
and a tracking server, each tracking server responds with a different value of V. So in this case, V, which is the encoding of 10456, if you recall the, one of the previous slides, is, is, will, be res, will be sent back to the browser, whereas if the browser would have access 10123, V would have been equal to one. And so in, the, in our case, V is equal to two, and the browser and the snippet collects the V values for X1, X2 to Xn, and it can then encode and compose uh, the full ID. So, uh, what are the obvious two requirements of, of, from, a, um, from a tracking technique like this? The first requirement is that the same client must get the same ID each time, for a at least for a reasonable time. And this is handled by the fact that the stub resolver caches this list in and retains its order. So on subsequent invocations of, invocations of the snippet, the snippet will get will ask the stub resolver, and the stub resolver will answer from the cache with the, the same list in the same order. So the browser will keep accessing 10456 and will keep getting v equals two. The second requirement is a bit more tricky. Uh, different clients must get different IDs. Uh, obviously, this will happen here when the two clients do not share the resolution platform. If there are two resolution platforms, each of them acts, will access anonymity.fail uh, separately and will get a randomly ordered list separately. So the two browsers eventually will get a different, uh, uh, differently ordered lists. However, what happens when this, those clients are behind the same resolver? Uh, the, res the, resol the resolver caches the list, and if the resolver provides the list in the same order, then the, the clients, will, then the stub resolver will get eventually the same order, uh, the, the list in the same order, and all the clients will get the same IP, right? Well, not necessarily. Uh, fortunately for uh, for the attacker, Bind9, which is by far the most popular DNS resolution platform, which, which is li literally the majority of DNS resolvers out there use Bind9 happens to uh, randomize the order on each axis of the stub resolver. And as you can see here, the stub resolver, in this case, if you've noticed, will gets a, different, a differently ordered list than the original order of the list provided to this resolution platform. And each subsequent uh, uh, query, uh, regardless of who the stub resolver is, will get a randomly ordered list, which, which provides us with the necessary, necessary randomness. Uh, furthermore, Microsoft DNS Server and Mara DNS Server do round robin. We can, use, we can still use this, although it's not random, and we can ex we explain this in the paper. Our only problem is, is with Unbound and Power DNS Server, which have fixed order, and this uh, is not good for the uh, tracking technique, uh, but they are, all, they are only uh, form a very small portion of the landscape. Furthermore, if we have a load balanced farm of resolvers, this, the, the randomness introduced by the load balancing can counteract the fact that we, the, the, the potential fact that we have two or three uh, uh, resolvers which use a fixed order uh, uh, lists, because the randomness of the load balancers ensure that different uh, users go to different, load, different resolvers and get different IDs, even if those IDs are fixed per resolver. We, uh, so that's the, naively speaking, the technique. We have some complications and limitations. In Windows, we, dis, we uh, surprisingly uh, uh, discovered that there is actually a, a dual cache. Internet Explorer Edge and Firefox use one cache, uh, one DNS cache, and Chrome and Opera use a different uh, DNS cache. It's explained in the paper, a very amusing uh, fact. Uh, on macOS, Chrome has its own stub resolver. It does not use the operating system stub resolver. So obviously, um, the Chrome on macOS uh, will, issue, will, will get issued a different ID than Safari and Firefox on, 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 on macOS. TTL cap is enforced by both resolvers and, uh, and stub resolvers, and this reduces the longevity of our technique. As I said, disconnecting from one network and reconnecting to another network flushes the DNS cache and kills the ID. And of course, restarting the machine kills the ID. 
So how do we score with, res with respect to the six uh, requirement or the six challenges? Privacy mode bound boundary, we are doing very well. Both modes use the same stub resolver cache, DNS cache, so we get the same ID. Identical hardware and software, we are doing well because each device will get its own ID. Uh, coverage is pretty good. We, coverage, uh, we cover uh, over 90% of the uh, scenarios for enterprises. Historically enough, we are doing well, uh, except for uh, Chrome and Mac, on Mac OS. Uh, browser restart, we are doing well, and being cross-browser, is we are doing uh, well, except some uh, uh, combinations uh, like the, the Windows uh, dual cache. What about mitigations? Uh, we, we devised a systematic solution, and the, which is two-pronged, but we and we do need the, the two uh, the, the two uh, prongs uh, in it uh, uh, simultaneously. Uh, browsers can use a random IP from the list of IPs provided to them from the stub resolver uh, for each new connection. And uh, the resolvers, the, the uh, uh, resolution platforms, need to, to be, need to implement a sticky by IP DNS load balancing. This ensures that two clients, uh, that, that, it, that a single client will get uh, will all, always get to the, to the same uh, resolver machine, and therefore, if there are multiple if there are uh, multiple resolvers in the resolution farm, in the resolver farm, there will be only as many IDs as there are uh, resolvers. And typically, let's say that we have two, three, four resolvers, then we all all we have uh, are two, three, or four uh, IDs shared in an organization of thousands or tens of thousands of machines. That, that's pretty much a, a killer for this technology. A uh, user can also opt to use a forward uh, shared HTTP proxy or Tor. Of course, this is, this is uh, all well for individual users. It's not a solution for organizations and universities. Uh, users can opt to flush DNS cache very often or, in, in the extreme case, uh, disable DNS caching altogether. Of course, this has some uh, performance penalties. And of course, uh, it, you, one can track down or, or, or uh, monitor a domain, uh, monitor the, the domains used, used by this uh, technique. Uh, it's of course, uh, it's a cat and mouse game, so we do not really recommend this approach. And to conclude, uh, we've seen a new user tracking method, which is DNS-based, uh, which crosses the privacy mode boundary and handles the golden image challenge. It has good coverage, and it is not easy to mitigate. And while we conducted our research, or the byproduct of our research, uh, we uh, outlined the, the, the DNS load balancing strategies we bumped into. And this, is, this is, can be a standalone uh, result that, that it can help an uh, attacker to connect to a specific resolver, say, and maybe poison it. And we also uh, document uh, systematically some information about resolver software, sub-resolver software, and browser DNS behavior. Thank you very much. <laughs> On Windows, is it that they use different uh, DNS caches within Windows, or just that they have their own local? So you said on Windows there is a difference between the browsers, right? But is it just that the browser does DNS cache pinning internally, or is it just different stores and windows? No, well, I'm not sure what the exact uh, implementation or peculiarity that leads to this, to, to this situation, but what we observed is that if you use get ADDR info with address family any, which is zero, you get one DNS cache, and if you uh, use get ADDR info with uh, AF in family INET, INET4, mm -hmm. you get a second DNS cache magically. I am not sure why this happens, but it is co consistent, and we measured it from various angles, and it behaves like this, funnily enough. Okay. All right, thanks. <laughs>